Beautiful. Well, thank you, Janet. Thank you to you and your whole development team, as well as the Dean's team for organizing this event. Um, we're grateful. So, so welcome everyone. I am Mary McKay. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the Brown School and, and also the great honor of welcoming you to the Brown School Convocation and the Distinguished Faculty Presentation for 2020. This is a presentation like no others uh, in that we are physically distant, but now gathered as a community um, to begin a, an academic year and to honor one of our really distinguished colleagues. Um, so our speaker today is Deborah Hare Joshu. And Deborah, you know that you hold the Joyce Wood Endowed Professorship. And on the line in some of these squares today, we have uh, Joyce Buckhart, who uh, supports your professorship and has been a champion truly of you, this important work you're gonna present our school. Um, and so Joyce, uh, I can't see you, but know that we're incredibly grateful that, that you've come to, to hear this lecture. Also, I believe Chancellor Mark Wrighton has signed on. So Deborah, you are uh, attracting um, so many important leaders uh, across the university, across our school, across our alumni and student bodies. Thank you so much. Um, we're incredibly grateful um, for you sharing your work with us today. So um, I have a lot to say about Deborah on this page. Um, and I'm gonna tell you some of what's on this page. Uh, as I introduce her as our distinguished faculty uh, member today. Um, so Deborah, you have spent a career really focused in on population-wide interventions to reduce obesity, to prevent diabetes for underserved women and children. And is that commitment that you and I actually overlap a great deal is how is it that we actually improve the well-being of, of children and the, the adults who raise them, in my case, but in your case, women and their children. Your title today, uh, Reducing Chronic Disease Disparities in Women's Health, Moving Science to Real World Impact, is a commitment that I know that so many of the Brown School community and so many across the university share that our science needs to matter in the real world, in the lives of the, the populations that we care about. And, and so your devotion to that, uh, you know, your commitment to impact is incredibly important to so many of us. And, and, and you're one of the faculty leaders that led the way. You wear multiple hats. And I, I could actually go through and talk about your appointment at the School of Medicine. Uh, the, the centers that you are directing, the teams, um, both here locally, but really that have national reach. Um, and so, so those of you that are really interested in this extended biography, you should go to Deborah's bio page and you'll see the unbelievable set of leadership roles that you actually are trying to manage mostly simultaneously. So, so uh, you're a gifted, multitasking leader for sure. The other thing I can say about you, Deborah, as a colleague, is you're just expert in your field. You're a role model for many of us. And um, full disclosure, Deborah was part of the search committee that brought me to the Brown School. And it was her and some of our other colleagues at the Brown School that truly inspired me to come join your community. Um, and, and to join a community of people that wanted their science to matter. And so I'm incredibly grateful for the snowy evening that I spent with you and Enola over a glass of wine. You probably sealed the deal, although Chancellor Wright had something to do with that as well, and I know he's listening. So, um, so thank you for everything that you do to inspire the next generation and all of us around you. So in addition to giving this lecture, We've also sent you in advance um, an award that uh, Deborah has agreed to hold up in this kind of virtual way that we're trying to figure out how to, to, to transmit awards um, as, as really our distinguished faculty member of 2020. So um, if I could get a virtual hand clap from all of us, no, just know that we're thrilled for you to recognize you and thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Okay, thank you so much. And I, I wanna make sure everybody saw the award. I can't 
tell who sees what. So, um, well, I definitely, I wanna thank Mary for that really um, generous um, introduction and um, I'm very thrilled to be here to be able to give this talk today. And as I said to others, and I said to her when she came on, I think we need to get her an award for negotiating us through, through um, COVID because I believe when we hired her, we said other duties as a sign, but I don't know that she was thinking this. Um, so I definitely want to thank her for that wonderful introduction and thank all of you for giving me this award today. Um, I want to talk about some of the work that I've done, but before I do that, um, I really want to acknowledge um, some of the people who um, work with me and, and have supported my work and without whom I couldn't have done this work. And interestingly, um, oops, I don't think I can get my slides to move. Let's see, there we go. Um, I wanted to thank Joyce and I, I don't know, I guess she's in one of the boxes out there, but Joyce has been a phenomenal supporter of the work that I have done. And, and more than that, she's just, a, a, just such a nice person and has been an advisor to me um, since um, I was lucky enough to get the endowed chair that she so graciously um, endowed and is named for her. She's a, a wonderful supporter of the work we do. Um, and she um, is such a pleasure. And I miss not being able to meet with her in person um, and know that we will get through this COVID thing and then we will be able to resume our, our regular talks. But I wanna thank her so much because her support has meant so much to the work we do and so many of the students I work with and it's just been phenomenal. So thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to thank the collaborators. The work I'm presenting today is, is teamwork. We're really big on transdisciplinary team science here at Brown and nowhere is that more, more relevant and no, more present than in the work that I do. Um, I have so many collaborators. It's wonderful for me to sit down and sit in a room with a whole bunch of smart people who make my work so much better. Um, everybody that I work with, students, faculty, community members, they, they, are, they give their time, they're great collaborators. I have gaps in what I do. I sit down and the gaps get filled. And these are just some of the people that, that I've had the pleasure to work with. And much of what I'm presenting today has benefited from their hands-on work, from their ideas, from their telling me that what, what I'm doing is going down a wrong path or I'm going down the right path. It makes the work better. And we are driven by the goal to improve health and to improve population health, particularly for those who are at a, a great disadvantage. So I wanna thank all of them. And I wanna thank Chancellor Wrighton, who I'm thrilled. I wish I could see him as well. I didn't know he was in one of the boxes, um, but he has also been a tremendous supporter and is probably the reason I'm here as well. Um, so I definitely wanna acknowledge that and thank him so much for all of his, all of his help over the years and support for, for the work that I do. So I wanted to set the stage um, a little bit and, and cover five things. And, and the first is, it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about obesity and diabetes in the midst of COVID-19 to at least place this epidemic in the midst of what we have going on right now um, in this pandemic. But then I wanna to move towards talking about how we can prevent some of this and really focus on um, the populations that I've worked with primarily over the last several years, and that's with young women. Um, and, and really young parents. Um, talk about some of the interventions that we have to prevent risk and what's happened with those with these populations and some of the partnerships with the non-health real world settings that have, have really served as, as laboratories um, for research that is hopefully going to impact populations that otherwise don't have great access or uptake with the things we do. And I wanna end with the what ifs, which um, I'm hoping we can have some discussion around because I love the what ifs and I'll talk about those. So before I start, I think it's always good to, to, to somehow frame the problem. And so I talk about the dual diseases of, of obesity and diabetes. Obesity leads to diabetes, overweight and obesity, run together um, and are a tremendous um, issue that we deal with and they're preventable. Um, our total US population right now, adult population is around 328 million as of yesterday. 
according to census, changes a little bit. When we look at adults with overweight or obesity, we talk about them being about 70% of our population. That's approximately 230 million people. And these are approximations, but this gives you a sense of what the issue is. And the reason why it's an issue is because obesity really is a complex disease, a complex metabolic disease that leads to multiple other conditions and comorbidities and, and Early, um, early disadvantage and early death. And overweight leads into that. So we're talking about a major disease that's been around now for a couple of generations. And, and as you can see from those numbers, doesn't look like it's going anywhere. It leads into prediabetes and diabetes. And when we look at that, we talk about 42% of our country having prediabetes, that's 137 million people. And with type two, we've got another 9% or approximately 29 million. So we're talking about major disease, which we can prevent. We know how to prevent for the most part, but it's just continuing over time. When we couch that in COVID, because those are chronic diseases, what does that mean in terms of COVID? Well, we've all seen the news um, about the underlying conditions and how, how they're so much so detrimental um, in COVID. And we know people with overweight, obesity, they don't get COVID more often, but when they get it, it's much more detrimental. And this is just some recent data. It changes every day, but this is recent data from the CDC, which shows that the risk for hospitalization of people who have these, these very common diseases now, these very chronic, chronic, chronic diseases with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, which runs with it, kidney disease, which runs with it, and the combination of these, they're three to five times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID and have worse outcomes. And it's, it's disparities. These disparities run with these, these chronic diseases and these disparities run in COVID. Um, and so what you see is that compared to the white population, American Indians, Black or African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, you're gonna see double the cases of hospitalization um, in these groups, um, double the cases, oh, four to five times the amount of hospitalization once the cases are identified, and then one to two times increased risk. So we're talking about COVID, which people have said have highlighted, they, they say it's highlighted gaps, it's highlighted um, problems, it's, it's identified gaps in our public health and other systems which have been, um, which have, are difficult, that people have shined a light on that. Those were not surprising to the people living this. And those gaps, many of us knew have been there. And as much as this is a challenge, it's also an opportunity. I'm glad that it's, people know the gaps are there, but I would argue that here at the Brown School and the populations we work with knew for a long time those gaps were there. Now we have an opportunity, hopefully, to do something. So when I look at this, when I look at the work that I've done over several years and with the input I've had from the team that I've worked with as well, we're looking at this intergenerational epidemic. And, and at some point, treatment is one thing, but we need to prioritize prevention. Um, and if you prevent it, you're going to be a lot better off. It's a lot harder to treat. Beginning about 2000, for good political reasons, we targeted childhood obesity, and we still do. And we, we did it because we had this increase. Children were, st adults, young adults had had it for a while, but children were now showing up with, with obesity and they were getting type two diabetes. And so around 2000, National Academy of Medicine, Surgeon General, they were coming out with reports saying, we've got to do something about this. It was easier to get adults to do something for their children than for themselves. Um, I mean, we, we were going to have a tough time getting parents to do change policies around food or activity um, for them because they were adults. Look at the masks. We can't really get people to wear masks. So targeting children made sense. We did a lot of work around that. We continue to do work. It's important work and it's even slowed down um, childhood obesity a bit. But from child to young adulthood, Children, we have 17% obesity. By the time they hit 18, between 18 and 39 years of age, 34% are obese, which is a doubling, which is really something if you were thinking about a chronic disease. On average, everybody probably gains on average um, a half to one kilogram a year, one to two pounds a year, which I tell my students all the time, between 20 and 40, that means you know, you're gonna gain 20 to 40 pounds if you're not if you're not careful, which in many cases pushes to overweight obesity, which I've argued is about the one thing they always remember from my class. 
um, is that they're going to gain this weight on average. But that also says the setup for the chronic disease that, that pushes people into it. Women 18 to 39 have had the greatest increase in obesity prevalence in the past 45 years and probably been the least studied group. They are very vulnerable to weight gain, probably because of child, childbirth, um, multiple pregnancies, retaining weight. They're working, they're taking care of other people, they're doing other things um, and not being active and eating like they should, et cetera. And so women have borne the brunt of, of the obesity epidemic. Nowhere is that clearer than when we look at disparities. Um, this is disparities, racial ethnic disparities by male, female, gray is male, red is female. And you can see from the first set of bar graphs that black females, 57%, and Haynes, 57% in this young age group are obese. For Hispanic females, 43% versus 33% for males. And then for white females, it's 33 versus 29% for males. So they've borne the brunt and the disparities that we know exist, the racial ethnic disparities are there again. These are preventable things. This suggests something's going on other than biology that's causing this. And this leads to a variety of, of complex issues, complex environmental issues, social determinant issues, policy issues, all of those things. But this is continuing and it hasn't, it hasn't, um, it hasn't changed in the way that it should have for what we know. So what do we do if we know these things? If we have efficacious interventions that can prevent this, what's going on? What are these efficacious interventions and where are we with getting this to reach especially young women, but, but certainly young men, young people. So the example I always use is from the Diabetes Prevention Program. Wonderful model program based on an outstanding national clinical trial, a multi-site trial that was done, um, examined three conditions usual care condition, a condition using metformin to, to see what would happen over time, and a lifestyle condition. Actually, uh, WashU was one of the many sites. It was a diverse sample of, of uh, people with prediabetes. The trial got stopped a little early because it was so successful, and what they found was that the lifestyle intervention, if you've got a 5 to 7 percent weight loss, you could prevent or delay diabetes incidence by 58 percent in high-risk individuals and by 71% in older adults. That's amazing. Just with lifestyle intervention, better than the drugs, better than other things. Um, it was a very intense in intervention, it is a very intense intervention, it's 16 weekly sessions. They got lifestyle coaches, contacts, supervised intervention, then bi-monthly sessions, and then even went on a little longer in most cases. And they followed a very, very strict protocol. It was a clinical trial, very strict pro protocol with these coaches and follow-up, wonderful results. Outstanding. I remember when it came out and my initial reaction was, that's great, but how's that going to work in the real world? And the response from some of the folks was, we find the ingredients that work, now you got to make it work in the real world, which is, is always interesting. But yeah, that's right. That's a challenge. So since that trial um, in 2010, the CDC, after looking at different people trying different ways, working through the YMCA, different ways to get this really wonderful intervention out in the real world, they developed the National diabetes program based on this original efficacy study, and they partnered with public and private organizations to do that. As of 2017, the most recent data, which is just out in the paper that's in Diabetes Care Now, is the National DPP is data on 581 organizations with about 41,000 participants. And the data from that in the target age group that, that we're talking about, by age, about 2.4% of those participants were 18 to 29, and then 30 to 44, which is a little older than the age group, but, but close that, that I was talking about to 40, there's about 14% participants. So, so fairly low, but, but you know, that's what we've got. The retention, when you talk about who actually completes the program, 18 to 29, about half of those 2.4% completed, and a little over half of the 34 to 44 year olds completed. So you're really talking about approximately 3,500, 3,600 um, of the young, young adults um, who completed this program. In that same age group, 24% have prediabetes. That's almost 37 million. So that's a great intervention and it works in many ways and it's doing good work, but it's not necessarily reaching people the way they need to be reached. And we know young women bear the brunt. So why don't they come? 
and why don't they stay? We know somewhat about women um, with different surveys and even with the work that we've done. Most women who are parenting and working um, say they don't have time. They pay job, they come home, they, they've got jobs, they've got household work, and now they're homeschooling and etc. Not saying that doesn't affect the partners and spouses as well. It does, but women tend still to bear the brunt and even now in COVID um, are spending more time, approximately five more hours, I think it depends on the study you look at. Women make less than their jobs. Women are paid less than men. Um, and have less flexible jobs. I think the last data I saw on the pay inequity it was about um, 82 cents on the dollar for a man with unadjusted rates. With the adjusted rates for age and education, that gap was closed, but over time you're still looking at quite a gap. I think with adjusted was more in the 95th percentile or something like that. So it was better, but it's still, women tend to occupy the, the low income um, service jobs more. And a big one was the lack of child care. Minimal access to quality, affordable care for their children made it hard for them to go to work or to keep their jobs. There's a paper out um, from Hashikawa that talks about child care and COVID even and how much worse it's gotten. But half the population lives in child care deserts. Much of the population, um, even if they have subsidized care, have trouble um, getting children to that care and, and child care workers are very underpaid. So there's a big turnover. And many of those child care centers are, are not able to stay open because they don't, they can't stay supported, especially in COVID. So it's going to become worse. And it costs about, on average, about 16,000 a year for one child on average um, for child care. Um, in general, and some of that's much higher where you live. So, so unaffordable, unattainable. All of these things, oops, all of these things made me um, step back a while ago and think about what do we want to do to to deal with this. We've got an intervention, we've got populations that need it. How do we accommodate this to have impact with the science that we're doing? And we can look across the life course and we know we've got populations at risk for disparities. We know about the social determinants and how they influence that. The National Academy of Medicine many years ago and has done just great work developing different um, frameworks to talk about how we need to intervene. And they've talked about the message environment, the school environment, which we've made a lot of progress. I mean, we had done quite a bit around childhood lunches and childhood diet, um, work site programs, trying to improve communities with infrastructure, et cetera, and healthcare. All of those things were great, but it didn't speak to what we were hearing from women and families. We don't have time, we can't get there, we don't have childcare, we can't get it done. So that was when I began looking more towards how do we do it at home? Is there some way we could bring the intervention to them? Is there something we could do? In order to do that, you have to partner with real world organizations. And the one that comes to mind is, well, what about home visiting? You know, home visiting organizations, you have reach. They're available, they're accessible, they're affordable usually, they're convenient. Many strengths, they meet the family where they are, so they deal with whatever their priorities are to help support them. They address essential conditions, social needs, social determinants, and they reinforce with ongoing support and change. So really, an infrastructure outside of healthcare that was like, huh, this might answer what we're hearing. The challenges are they're not healthcare focused. That's not what they get reimbursed to do. Um, and so how do you come in with a healthcare agenda and fit that? What do you do, layer that onto the content they've got? That's not gonna work. How are you gonna do that and include content? Well, many years back, <laughs> I, for reasons that I, to this day, boy, you know, you never know what's going to happen in your career. I still remember thinking, gosh, and there's as parents as teachers, many of my uh, team members were saying, oh, gosh, this is a great group. They come and visit me. They make me feel better. They help me with my child. And I was looking for a partner to try to accommodate some of what we were hearing and the great work that I thought I was doing on clinical trials. It wasn't going anywhere. I mean, I shouldn't say it was. It was going, but it was going slowly. So I knocked on their door and started talking with them about doing work together. Parents as teachers, some of you know about them, but they, they are an early child development program, getting children ready for school, supporting parents, an evidence-based curriculum. They do trainings and screenings. They have over 11,000 certified educators. They do up to 24 visits a year for free in the home um, for high needs parents. They're in multiple sites, over 3,100 sites across all 50 states. They see almost 200,000 parents and children, and they're diverse. 
American Indian families, black families, Hispanic, Latino, and white families. A wonderful infrastructure where we could reach families that otherwise were not being reached. And this was the map of their locations. And I still remember when I saw it, um, I was thinking about all of these things when I was talking with them. I literally, I wanted to do a flip, um, which my children say, you need to get a life if you get excited about a map that has all these sites. I was like, it's infrastructure. It's way we can reach people. This is really great. Um, and that's what started our partnership. We've worked together really since 1995 was when I knocked on their door, but we've done a number of studies over the years. The goal, their goal is to improve the lives of their families. And, and my goal, my mission is really the same with a different perspective around obesity prevention, diabetes prevention, improving nutrition, improving activity, all of those things that we know can go through life and help them. And so we've done many studies and I just wanna talk briefly about two, uh, really they're two, well, they're really four, but they're connected um, um, that are currently ongoing to give a sense of what, what has come out of this partnership, which has been just an amazing, uh, learning experience as well. First study, um, which, which is, this was after we've done several with them, but we, we started in 2012. Um, it was called Healthy Eating and Active Living Taught at Home. And it was to adapt the DPP. You saw the DPP, 16 sessions, all that stuff. Um, and we wanted to see if we could find the key ingredients to work it had, so it fit. It was embedded within what parents as teachers did so that it would work to help improve um, and prevent weight gain. Um, and we did it around the St. Louis region. We did a, a, a randomized trial. We had overweight and obese women in the high risk group with preschoolers. They all had preschoolers. Many of their children were already high risk for weight. And we were going for a 5% weight loss. We were going over 24 months since it was gonna be slower. Um, and we sat down with them and, and worked to figure out how we were going to get key ingredients. And we brought the science, they brought the practice. That's the best way I know to sum it up. We sat down and said, this is what needs to get in. And they sat down and said, this is how we're going to do it. We recruited women who were just about 32, 33 years of age, overweight, obese. Um, we had about 42% overall who were black and we, they were generally um, on WIC or, or we had a large proportion that were low income. Our results were interesting because the first year results, which is the first bar graph there, were significant. Um, and we got about a 2.8 kilogram change, about six pound change. But if you look, there wasn't a whole lot of weight loss going on there. There was a whole lot of weight gain, but it was significant. Um, I didn't do flips, but it was significant. This is where I started doing flips because what we had here was what we saw from the other data, women gain weight and parents as teachers are supportive. So this, these women probably do better than just the general population. The women with the gray bar, they were continuing to gain weight. Our women were starting to lose weight more, which is unusual in weight loss trials. You usually see regain. Our women over time were losing weight. The other women were doing what the population does, which is gain weight. It was over a 10 pound difference. And because parents as teachers continues with the family, potentially this weight loss or at least maintenance of that would go, would continue. And that was significant. We also saw significance when we did waist circumference, which is a big predictor of cardiovascular disease. A one inch difference, a little over one inch, which was significant in a year. And we had two, almost two and a half inches at, um, at two years. It was really amazing because it's hard to get and we saw these gains and we saw continuous loss. That led to an application for a health study for dissemination and implementation. Those of you at Brown know we have probably some of the best implementation scientists in the world. Um, they literally wrote the book, uh, Ross Brownson and Noel Proctor, Doug Luke, and Rachel Tabak, who is very dedicated, as you can see here with her twins reading the DNI textbook to them because you can never start too soon. Rachel is leading our study, um, funded study through NIH, um, to do a dissemination implementation study to see if we can get health across nationwide. And this is where I said, talk about working with great people, filling in the gaps. These are implementation experts who can take this intervention and we're gonna know empirically what works and what doesn't work across 28 sites with over 500 moms nationwide. Just in a, it's an amazing opportunity 
And, um, and she's just outstanding in doing this. Um, and we're lucky that we have people that we can work with to do this. So she's leading our team to do this and we are, we're already recruiting even in COVID and, and it's going great. That leads me to the second example, which is the Life Moms trial. Life Moms trial is a trial that was um, recently ended. Um, it was called Lifestyle Interventions for Expectant Moms and it targeted pregnant women. Um, it was put on by several of the agencies at NIH, um, Seven Site Consortium. We, it was testing behavioral interventions to improve pregnancy outcomes in women at risk, um, overweight and obese. Um, and it was seven different interventions, seven different sites. Um, some of the interventions gave women packaged food. Some of the interventions did intensive clinical visits. Some of the interventions did an app where women would record what they ate. We worked with parents as teachers and we did an in-home intervention that was embedded um, because we wanted something that would stay and could potentially have national impact. So very, very different than the very con more confined, um, not totally confined, but the, the more specific kinds of interventions the other sites did. And we worked with Black women in St. Louis because they were three to four times more likely to die, had pregnancy-related deaths than were white women. And so we wanted to target the hardest to reach and the highest risk. We recruited about 267 women, um, most lived in poverty. Um, over 67% moved at least once in five months, so, so a little unstable and, and difficult circumstances. Both groups, whether they got regular PAT or our intervention, got clinical care. And then, of course, regular PAT, and then they had uh, prenatal visits in which we embedded information around diet and lifestyle. This was a younger group. Um, but overweight and obese and primarily Medicaid. And what we found was that we had significance on gestational weight gain. We had equivalent to all the other groups, all of the groups were equivalent, no matter what the intervention, different ethnicities, different populations, all of our interventions got the same result, which was really kind of surprising. We had significant reduction in fat, but the interesting thing was when you came to postpartum, one year later, we got more of our women to back to a baseline weight, very high risk women got them back to baseline weight than did regular PAT. And actually, if you look at, the, again, the general population, it was even much higher. So we were very excited that we had kind of the same graph we had with the health trial. We had a difference, a slighter difference at gestational weight gain and a greater difference than um, as it got to the postpartum area, which was a seven pound difference. This was very, very telling and very exciting as well in the world that I work in. And so what did we do? Well, Rachel, myself, and our team then applied and received funding then to see if we can take this, this grant. And the idea here again is that we could recruit pregnant women, we can do it in diverse sites, and can we have further impact with this intervention and reach people who otherwise have not benefited as they should from what we know about the science. Can we embed science in practice and in this infrastructure to affect gestational weight gain and postpartum weight retention to reduce obesity and diabetes risks? And these are some of our team and our, and our uh, parent educators who work with the families in their home to do that. And let me tell you, I said, we bring the science, they bring the practice, it's amazing how they incorporate the science into working with children and working with mothers. It's amazing to watch. So that leads me to the last, the last part of, of what I'd like to talk about. And that is, this is wonderful, but I think what drives, what drives what I do, I suspect what drives my colleagues at the Brown School and probably many of you is, I always ask, but what if, what if, you know, it's almost like you, you get an answer to a question and then you chase the next question because you want to make things better. You want to make your impact more. You want to improve the world in some ways, um, in many ways. And in order to do that, you ask what if. So some of the ways I ask what if around the work that I've done is related to the issue of equity. The interventions that I do, my colleague Felicia Hill Briggs has said um, at Johns Hopkins, we do compensatory interventions. What we try to do is compensate 
for, for all of the environments that people live in and, and the social determinants that prevent many times them from benefiting from what we know and what we do. Compensatory interventions are necessary and they're life-saving and, and you have to do them, people need them, that's great. But what if we did other interventions at a greater rate that could help to take care of some of those things in a bigger picture way. So when I think about that, I think, what if equity was the goal of diabetes prevention? Weight would be an outcome, but what if equity was our goal? So if social determinants are the drivers of diabetes prevalence and costs and burden, then we should work with social determinants. We should do something around them. We should change our focus, have compensatory interventions, but what we call um, in, in the diabetes world and what we promote in the diabetes world, is what about moving to more towards next generation interventions that address the foundational causes of the disparities we see around systems change, policy change. There are many people doing this work. We need to do more of this work. We need to implement large scale solutions that will help to control, adjust, eliminate some of the negative social determinants, promote the positive social determinants so that it would affect or reduce, for example, diabetes. We would measure and track change in social determinants just as we do in clinical indicators, not just mark that they're there, but mark change because it would be one of our goals. So how does that play out? How does that, you know, we have the reality as in my, as in my picture there, we have the reality, we go for equal, equality, and it sounds good, but equity is action and extra, equity is what we need. How do, we, how do we do that? What if? Well, I translate into women for years can continually, and especially now, talk about childcare being a major issue that prevents them from participating in many things. So what if childcare, quality childcare was our intervention for diabetes prevention? It's a structural inequity that we know is especially hard in low-income communities and unaffordable for many, if not majority of parents and a major issue. If we prioritize childcare as essential infrastructure as, as several papers in Hashikawa suggest, um, then it could be a critical way to prevent chronic disease such as overweight, obesity, diabetes. We could adjust um, resource allocations so that they didn't contribute to the inequities but actually contributed to equity. We know that parents need childcare. The education for the child's good. It helps over time. And actually, we build in a lot of compensatory interventions to make childcare settings more healthy. So that's a good thing. We know that it can help parents to get to work. They have better work when they can go, and it helps their income. So they need childcare, and good childcare is unaffordable or unavailable, or childcare lack of it has a negative consequences. Maybe that's the intervention that we try to do. I mean, what if? just thinking about what if that's possible. You know, I've heard that, um, and we hear regularly that it's unaffordable, that in fact, um, childcare is too costly. It's, it's how would we even do it? Um, and it's, it's, it's gonna cost a mint. $327 billion a year is a lot of money. That's what we spend, spent in 2017 on diabetes one for every four healthcare dollars um, in diabetes. That's a lot of money. And so I don't know um, exactly what the solution is. I'm, I'm asking the what ifs, but that's where you get really smart people in a room and you start rethinking how you do interventions. Um, it, I've heard, you know, people say it's impossible. And I say, well, we put a man on the moon in 10 years because we decided we want to do it. I think we can fix this. Um, and that's just an example of rethinking how we intervene. Always compensatory interventions are necessary, but what if we took it a step further, as many do, but do it even more? And I think it could be really exciting and could be really telling. Um, so on that note, I, I am very, very thankful um, for this time with all of you. I am very, very privileged to have received this award. Um, and I am, I can thank, I thank Mary so much, Joyce, um, Chancellor Wrighton and others for supporting me all this time and allowing me the privilege of doing this work and working with some really, really great people who, um, who really make me so much better and make it a pleasure 
um, to do the work that I do. So on that note, thank you so much. And I, and I will, um, I'm happy to turn it back over to Mary and take questions or hear other people's what ifs. Thank you. So, so um, Deborah, imagine that we, over a hundred of us are standing up and giving you a really well-deserved round of applause thank for you. the career that you had, the difference that you have made and the model that, that you just presented around true partnership to make women and their children's lives better. So, so imagine that for, for just a minute. Um, thank you. And we have some questions in the chat and I'm gonna encourage um, many others to, to write some questions and we'll try to, to I'll try to bunch them and, and get as many as possible in as, as, as time permits. Um, but I have a couple right off the bat. Okay. Your colleague, Ross Bronson, um, who is, I know, been really on this journey with you for a long time, is going to ask you a multi-part question. And, and so in particular, Ross, I think many other of us want to know about your partnership with parents as teachers and what advice you would give uh, to early career scientists around how you forge those partnerships, how you retain those partnerships over time. And based on what you've learned and the intensity of that learning, would you do anything different? So I'm going to have you go at that and then I'll ask you a few more from the chat, okay? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny what caused me, I think a lot about what caused me to originally go there and talk with them was I listened to the people around me talk about how great they were. That was one thing. But it was very clear from the first time we met that we had different ways, different kind of ways we were trying to get at the same thing, which was bettering the lives of women and children. And so it was a learning process. I mean, I look back and I think, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I would come in and think I was going to drop a clinical trial into a, a community um, organization and then call that a partnership. I don't think that I was, I, it took me a while to learn to be a partner. Um, and I learned to be a partner after I listened more and I trusted more because you had to give up, you know, I was used to having control over everything. I had to give up control. Um, and I think that they learned to trust me too, that we really were on, we really did want the same thing. We just were, were trying to figure out how to get there together. Um, I learned that, and when I said we brought the science and they brought the practice, I still am amazed at how talented practitioners can take science and, and they could communicate it in a way that I never could. I, I, I communicate differently. Um, and, and so trusting that they were experts in what they did helped our partnership along well. And it, it was a trust thing. It, it took time. Um, it was a learning curve. Um, but it worked because we really did want the same thing. We really did want the same thing. And we were willing to kind of navigate that to get there. So, um, so I, did I answer the question? He had two parts. He always does two parts. <laughs> I, think, I think you've gotten, uh, you know, I, I think the, the early advice to, to career scientists is in there, as well as how you had to change what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think, I think too, I, I really did, um, I, I, wanted an in, I wanted a way to make sure the work that I did didn't stay in the clinic. And yeah. that, that was a way to do it. And so, I don't know, it just worked. Maybe I was lucky. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that, I, I think there's there's a lot of hard work, and then there is some good fortune, you know, in yeah. community-based partnerships, and so um, and the shared goals, um, and so so let me ask you a couple of other questions, and this is a, a really important question for intervention researchers in general, and then in your area in particular. Our colleague Rupeng is talking about in some of our interventions, you see some improvement in an outcome. In in your case weight or, or other outcomes. And then you see some leveling off over right. time. And, and so are there ways that you could think about, um, is there additional ways to intervene in that leveling off? Is that problematic? But just talk to us a little bit about over time, these findings and, and things that you want to observe. Yeah. So it is true that over time, as the intervention goes away, the, the behaviors and the patterns tend to go back to what they were. And, and thinking about weight in particular, weight tends to go back up. Um, one of the things that I looked for in the infrastructure was, was there a way to keep the intervention going? You don't have to, what we were finding is you don't have to be intense. You just have to be consistent 
over time. We don't get to the behaviors we get to overnight. We learn over time to do those and are they're reinforced. So if you're going to change those and maintain it, you need a way to reinforce what you want people to do or what, what's the behaviors we're trying to get them to do over time. And so any kinds of interventions that allow for that. Um, in this case, it's, it's an infrastructure that has continued contact so we can get that. You can do booster sessions, you can do things like that. You know, this leads into, we can only do interventions and get them to work so long if we have a supportive environment that allows that as well. And that gets to the larger, the larger ways, the larger what ifs, if you will, of change that we can only do so much within certain environments. And once the intervention goes away and, the, and they're still in that environment, it's, it's almost they go back because that's the best way to adapt. Um, so I think we could do boosters, we can, we can build in infrastructure, we can build in contact, all of those things are critical um, and we should keep doing them, but we also need to look bigger picture. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's terrific. Thanks for sharing um, that. Okay, there's lots of things coming in the chat. So I, I'm going to um, combine a couple of these questions, if that's okay. So, so one is asked, uh, are all around communication. And mm -hmm. where um, uh, particularly early career scientists can get more support around how you really can communicate findings in a way that practitioners can pick up, um, you know, that community members can understand. And, and, and I, I, I wish that you talk a little bit about your use of self, because it's pretty um, amazing, you know, how you let your human qualities help people build trust and, and connection to you. And then the second set of questions have to do with not only success in communicating findings and building partnerships, but also you've gotten a lot of funding. Uh, and that requires a set of personal and research characteristics to be successful. So talk to us a little bit about how you've developed yourself to you know, really probably develop in ways around funding success, around writing success, around communication with others that mm -hmm. really grew your career. Um, I think, and, and Mary, you, you probably would identify this as well. I think when you have a passion for what you do and what you wanna do, that that, that sometimes comes out. So in the communication, with people, I, I talk to more people than I can imagine to get the projects going. I talk to anybody and everybody who would listen. Um, I took feedback from anybody who, who I could get it from. I do that today, oh my goodness. I, I get feedback from everybody um, to try to make sure whatever message I'm delivering, whatever I'm trying to say is appropriate, is relevant, and is gonna work. Um, and so, and I think if you really, you know, you really love what you do and, and people identify with that and identify, uh, again, joint, joint goals, joint mission, um, and you're willing to listen um, from multiple people. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I can't, I can't begin to tell you, even starting out, the number of people I talk with, I change things, I, I tried to get it to where, um, to where it would work. The other thing was I work with really good people. I have collaborators that I depend on, that I trust, um, that, that will tell me if I'm going off the rails or tell me if they think I'm on the rails. It's a team. It, it's, it's not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Getting funding is a team sport. Um, I fill a niche, but boy, I know what I'm not good at. And you find people who are good it's a team, you know, everybody's not a shortstop, everybody's not a pitcher. You find the team and you work with people um, who, who are good. We've got a lot of really good people. I showed you the pictures. We've got, I'm here because of all of those good people. Everybody fills a gap. And, and what I do is kind of, maybe it's a, when I've got a project, maybe it's a coach, you know, I have a vision and, but it's everybody working together to help me fill that in. And, and then you kind of pull it together. Um, so I guess it's, you love what you do, you, you make sure you listen to people and you work as a team. That's, that's what I would say. That's been probably the way I've done it. 
Others may see differently. That's what I do. That, that's terrific. Thanks for sharing. And I'd love to ask my own follow-up questions, but I feel a real responsibility to this. <laughs> so our colleague Joe <clears throat> is um, asking you the big question that many of us are asking in the science, which is, what would it take to truly eliminate these out the, 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 the negative outcomes that you're studying? What would it take? What's the time horizon? If you thought about kind of what needed to happen in a generation to truly get to a place where you were able to achieve equity. Talk to us a little bit about, is that possible? What would have to line up to, to make that happen? Um, and, and, and I think it probably goes, Joe is probably as interested in I am as that model that you put up around some of the things that we might not think of mm -hmm. as, as the real, levers to get mm -hmm. your women and, and children to, to true optimal health. So that's the big what if. He, he, yeah, we should put him on the mic. That's a big what if. Um, I don't know that I know it, it's complex. I don't know that I know everything we need. What I do know is that we know, we really do know how to prevent weight gain. We've got a pretty good handle around weight loss individually or even familially. What we don't have, it's people say, oh, when you talk about listening, people say over and over, we can't do this because we don't have the money and we're, we're doing fast food. We, we, um, you know, we don't have childcare, we can't get there. There's, there's all of those other social needs, social determinants. And honestly, diabetes and obesity isn't going to run somebody's life. That's not what they're doing at home. And so if what you need to do, I think, is create an environment, a structure that allows people to be able to take advantage of some of the science that we have. And we don't have that right now. I think that's when I think about some of the things that we need to put our time into and prioritize. And we know, we know from diabetes, we have a, a major paper coming out in December, which talks about the role social determinants play in creating or in contributing to this disease, then we have to start targeting changes in those. So I think when we see these numbers that are still going up in millions of people who still have this, and we have a pretty good idea clinically of what we need to do, we need to start looking at the bigger issues and we need to listen and change the structures so that it is equity in terms of being able to reach the intervention or is it equity in terms of being able to afford to pay for the intervention how do we do that i think we can do that through different child care support i think we could do it through health insurance support i think there are a number of ways we could do it um, I think it would take certainly some thought around that. I said, I hear a lot about, we don't know how to do it. We've, if we decide we want to prioritize health equity and we're measuring it, we would get it done. We're very, very good. We're very smart about those things, but we have to have it as a priority and a goal. And it hasn't really, I think maybe now, it hasn't really been a priority and a goal. If we want justice, we have to set the parameter that that's what we're shooting for, and then we'll figure it out. If we say it's too expensive, whoa. I think that we can make an argument that if we don't do it, it's more expensive. But I think we need to take care of some of the infrastructure issues that we've heretofore somewhat ignored um, because we've been trying to compensate for them. I mean, I think that, that your observations are, are right on. And, and let me just observe that you're also modeling. I think what our school is really so proud of is kind of the alignment of social welfare policies with healthcare policies, the, the kind of social uh, supports that are really needed to thrive in a society aligned with kind of health supports. It's really, um, you know, this integration is, is really what, what you're coming to and so many of our colleagues are coming to. So, so thanks for that answer. I'm going to take you in a little different direction. And I'm going to have you talk a little bit about what, what I'm going to call comorbidities. Like one of the questions asked about the relationship between sleep apnea and mm -hmm. weight gain and lost. And, um, but there's probably other um, factors 
that um, some of your programs either take into account or haven't tackled yet. And so could you talk a little bit about some of the cluster of overlapping sets of factors that make their, your programs either really hum or, or really kind of are impediments to getting the outcomes that you wish? Well, I, I certainly think that um, anytime with weight, you can look at blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, which among women, you know, women in their 50s um, have very high rates of, of heart attack. They almost get them younger than men sometimes. Um, and so the comorbidities that exist, sleep apnea is one. Um, uh, hypertension, I think, is a major one that we can really impact with any kind of slight weight differences, definitely affects blood pressure and, and blood pressure, higher blood pressure, especially when someone's 40 years old and they're prehypertensive or hypertensive, you're looking at early stroke. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about the five to seven percent difference in weight, which reduces diabetes, it reduces stroke, <laughs> reduces hypertension, there are all these other things that go together, they're coexisting. They're all together like in a little spider web or network. They're all connected. Um, obesity by itself, it's just such a complex disease. It's metabolic, it's behavioral, it's got all these pieces, but it leads to all of these comorbidities. And once diabetes sets in, hypertension sets in, kidney disease sets in, all of these things go together. Um, and so they're, they're intertwined. If we can change one thing and we can get weight down somewhat, we're gonna have a better effect on these others. So you're down to your last uh, 90 seconds or so. Okay. Final, final thoughts um, from, from you um, around what's next, either for you and colleagues or things that you see as opportunities. Sometimes um, in our current roles, we're pretty busy, but we see an amazing opportunity that we hope other people will walk and go grab for us. But anything that you want to kind of foreshadow in the future that you're particularly excited about as an opportunity? I, I mean, there's several. I think um, I'll, I'll throw one back that um, I think Ross has a paper out now about reimagining public health. Cool. I think some of the elements that are in there for reimagining public health speak directly to the work that I do and the work others do. And I could see where that could be a major focus of moving forward. Of, of work that many of us do or strive for. I really, um, I really want to move forward on um, the big picture kinds of interventions. I wasn't kidding about the childcare. I'd love to figure something out about childcare um, because I think that it could do so much in so many ways to help people and think about it as a scientific question um, of how it affects health. If we found something like that, something around um, something that we've been hearing for years, it really, and on its own, has nothing to do with health, and can, can think about that as an intervention and test that out to show its true effect um, of equitable kinds of things to help people. Imagine what that could lead to. COVID has, what COVID did was just point out gaps we knew were there. Now everybody knows they're there. So it's an opportunity to look at some of these things that have been highlighted in COVID and maybe take them to the next step to reinvent, reimagine public health, to reimagine how we think of interventions um, beyond compensatory. Um, I just think that that, that kind of drives it. Um, but, but, you know, I spend a lot, I wake up at 2 a.m. doing the what ifs sometimes, so I'll let you know next time, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> well, I think you can count on me and so many of our colleagues that you have inspired today. Uh, to, to be in this effort with you. And um, because those big ideas are actually gonna get us to what you really hope, which is women, um, their children have better health. And so with that, I'm gonna thank you. I'm gonna congratulate you on being our distinguished faculty uh, member. There's a ton of really love and support in this chat around uh, not only your amazing presentation, but you as a colleague. Um, and so although we might be physically distant, I just want you to channel all of us as you go and keep doing the really hard work, uh, you and your team. And thanks so much for sharing yourself and your work with all of us. You've been called a superstar and it just keeps going and going. So pay attention to that chat and congratulations, Deborah. Thank you all for uh, making this event possible. And, um, and so we're so grateful. And uh, Deborah, you'll be an internet star after this. And so uh, your, your talk will be posted on our YouTube channel. And, and we really do hope that you, your work, 
and our collective work makes the difference that you wish. So congratulations. Good Thank job. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you all. Thank you.